and good morning again. Um, today we are continuing to work through uh, Ephesians, that's where the lectionary has us, um, and I could have preached from that reading of John, but I chose to continue on in Ephesians, and we're looking at the lessons that we are learning uh, from that epistle, um, which means letter, I hope everybody knows it, I apparently spilled some water there, that's what happens when you have tremors. Um, we are looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. And this picks up right after where we were last week, when, when Paul ended that prayer. Uh, and if you remember verse 20 and 21 uh, in chapter 3 of Ephesians, Now to him who by the power of work within us is able to accomplish abundantly more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And from here, he's going to lead into this, uh, this next bit about the unity in the body of Christ. And that's the part we're going to focus the most on. But he has a little insertion in here. Um, if you're familiar with Paul, he has kind of an, a, a bit of attention deficit. He kind of tends to switch topics every once in a while and throw some kind of a little aside. That's why sometimes people think that those were additions. I think that most, most of those, I think, are just the way Paul thought. And Paul was kind of one of those people that just kind of bounced around from thought to thought. And if he thought of something, he had to write it down before it jumped out of his brain and went somewhere else. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. And the heading for this is, again, unity in the body of Christ. And it starts off with, I therefore. And remember, when you see therefore, you look at what became before that. And that's why I went back and read to you that ending about the, 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 about the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. All right? I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us has been given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descends is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were this, that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity to the measure of the full stature of, of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. Now, part of this, the very first verse we had there, verse 1 in chapter 4, he says, I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you. Um, that's one of the places where they, they, they many times will say, oh, this was written from a, from a prison cell because he's a prisoner, he's saying here. And it might have been. It may be that this was written from prison. Um, but there, that word that is translated as prisoner means one bound. It's the Greek word desmos, desmos. If I pronounced that correctly, I'm sure. It means one bound, one who is bound. So therefore, I, with I therefore, one bound in the Lord. He's a prisoner, it's, it's, he's tied up, he's bound to Christ. He's, he is bound to Christ. It's not, you know, don't look at this as him. It, it, he talks about his suffering, and we can look at it that way too. But he is captive, a captive Christ, if you want to look at it that way, not made in a bad way by any means, 
or a diabolical way, but in a loving way. He's captivated. You know, when you fall in love with your with your spouse, you are captivated, right? Use that word. She, you know, someone walks in the room, it's captivated everyone's attention. That's not a bad thing. You're captive to Christ. I beg you to leave a life worthy of the calling which you've been called. Now that's no small order, folks. I think we all understand that. It's to walk, in some translations, it says there, to walk in, to, in that calling, the way it's worded. And I, that brings up the, uh, the verse that I use from 1 John, you know, to live a life of love. That is the commandment, to live a life of love. Because some translations say, love, walk in it. And so we are to walk in a way of love. To live a life worthy of the calling that Christ has given us. With all humility, that's a tough one. All gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That doesn't mean that we turn our back on everything, does it? That doesn't mean that we ignore when someone has fallen away, when someone's doing something against the body. Well, we don't want to say that, say anything about they're, they're turning that tourniquet on that arm. We don't want to say anything because they, they might be upset that other, you know, the other arm. But that's in the end, that's going to cause division, isn't it? So we do have to point out some of these things, even at the, at the risk of it later. It says doctrine, but some of these things are not doctrine sin. We remember that sin is something that we, that we forgive, but we say, as Jesus said in John chapter 8, verses 11, 1 through 11, and this is a story of the woman caught in adultery. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placed her in the midst. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law Moses commanded us to stone such. What do you say about her? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the eldest. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus looked up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and do not sin again. That's the important part. Bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That doesn't mean that we don't recognize when someone's falling away. That doesn't mean that we, that we just say, hey. Um, it means that we realize and remember that we too have sinned. Because one of the things I think Jesus is doing there in that dust is he's listing the sins of those that are gathered there. That's one of the thoughts that, that uh, people suppose may have happened. We don't know. It doesn't say that. But... Think of how impactful that would be. You're saying they're saying, well, she's guilty of adultery, and he's writing your name in the dust and then putting your sin behind it. And your name in the next to the name in the dust, and your sin. Some of us would need a, a lot of dirt to write those sins out, wouldn't we? Uh, one would probably suffice. She's there only accusing her of one. But the point is, is that it's not that the, the sins are forgiven. But the instruction at the end is the important part. Verse 11, at the end of verse 11, go and do not sin again. So to watch them continue to turn the tourniquet is not unifying the body. In the end, the body is going to die, at least a portion of it. And as one portion dies, then no man no longer can, you don't have that hand to help collect food or whatever you might using that hand to do and now you're dependent on one now something happens to the other and you're really in trouble we need the whole body the whole body needs to be healthy so we need to support one another 
We need to be in unity, all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love. We come to each other when we see him falling away humbly, and we're gentle, and we're patient, because we understand that some things are really difficult for people to get around. But it doesn't mean that we let them continue to turn the tourniquet until the arm falls off. Because there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, who is above all and through all and in all. And in the last week of the week before, I mentioned the, the idea that as we get closer to the end times, the second coming, I prefer to call it second coming than end times, because it's the beginning of time, it's not an end time. It's the beginning of time, right? And whatever's going on here, but it's a beginning of time. It's a great time, it's a glorious time. But one of the signs I, that I've always thought when I'm reading things like this is that, that there would start to be more unity, that we would start to see some of those old wounds healed. And sometimes I take, I've taken some encouragement when I've seen the Orthodox Church talking to the Catholic Church and some of those things, and there have been some improvement. But then I'm disappointed when I see some things like the Southern Baptist Church is talking about splitting. Uh, the United Methodist Church is talking about splitting rather than coming back together. Verse 7, but each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. All are given the gift of Christ. And that is the gift. Verse 8 is actually Psalm 68, verse 18. That's, that is one of the Psalms. When he ascended on high, he made captive, it, captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. And the interesting thing about that is that uh, Paul uses verse 18, but when you go to Psalm 68, 19 and 20 are this. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation. And to God, the Lord, belongs escape from death. That's the gift, escape from death. I wish Paul would have kept that in there, but he didn't call me to edit for him, so. The part that is a little confusing is when it, verse nine, and he says, when it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? And there's some disagreement on that and what it means. And some, some would say that it's talking about Jesus coming into the world, you know, the first thing, first incarnation before the second coming. There's two comings, not three, by the way. Two comings. Um, I think that that's actually probably, which brings up some of the issue of the, 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 uh, the, the, the debate about um, whether this is one of Paul's authentic letters or whether this is a compilation. Because almost everything in here is, is included in some of the authentic letters. Pretty much 90, I think 90 some percent of this letter is a mention elsewhere in Paul's writings that are that are that are ironclad that people don't debate. I wonder about that because that's so very reminiscent of First uh, Peter, uh, but in chapter three, verses eighteen to twenty, uh, and when a couple several weeks ago, maybe a month ago, we had the Apostles' Creed, and I read from the Apostles' Creed, and in that it says he descended, Jesus descended into hell. And uh, I, I can remember that uh, you know, one of my Baptist minister friends, when, when he first heard, you know, we were talking in a Bible study, and I mentioned that about the Apostle Creed. Can you believe that there was a, he was in his late 70s. He wasn't really familiar with that being in the Apostle Creed. He's like, I've never heard that. And I'm like, how can you not have heard that? You've been a minister for so many years. How could you not know that? Um, but that's, this is the first Peter is where that comes from. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. That's talking about that Jesus descending into hell. And I'm not going to belabor that because that, that's, I think, some unnecessary theological debate. But that's what's going on here, and I think that's what Paul's talking about here. I think that's the reference to that. So whether 1 Peter is kind of building off of that, or that's building off 1 Peter, I don't know. And we don't know the date of 1 Peter either, so. 
But then he jumps back. He, he comes back to the topic of the gifts and the divine. And the gifts he gave were some would be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. That part there, everyone should be involved in that to equip the saints. In some way, either if it's just praying for those that are out in ministry, missionaries, and what have you, but you all, and I've said it before, and I'll say it till I die, we're all called to be missionaries for God. We're all called to live a life and witness to others so that they might see through us a glimmer, a faint reflection of the glory of God. That's what we're called to. That's part of being the Christian. That's part of being the body. And so he talks about that, that there's so many different needs. And I was trying to get to that with Jade, and it's a little difficult in children's sermon to explain that whole thing about the illustration of the body of Christ. And that becomes a little bit maybe morose for them, I think, perhaps. But we understand it. We understand that we need the head, we need the neck. You know, I quote from my big fat Greek wedding, you know, the, 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 the husband is the head, but the wife is the neck, and the neck can turn the head wherever she wants. You've mm -hmm. heard that one, right? That's just an aside. My wife really likes that quote. I like it a lot, but uh, I can throw that out. She's not here today, Gary, so she can't, she can't come out here tonight. So she, that's just watching it. Um, maybe she's watching. I, I doubt it. She's with her sister. Uh, but at any rate, we need all these different talents. We need all of these different things to support us. There's nothing else. Just to maintain this building, we need talents. Lonnie was up here this week looking at the air conditioning. We need somebody that can come and look at the air conditioning. Not that we don't pay them for that, but that we know who we can call when we need to call. And all of these different things. There's so many different things about the church that we need each other. Like I said, it's nothing else than just to be there praying for us and sending encouragement to one another. Even if you don't call the person to encourage them, but to pray a prayer of encouragement. And we need to do that for each other. So we need to put that on our prayer list of things we do. But speaking of the truth of love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. And that gets us back to that whole thing, from whom the whole body is joined and knit together. We have to make sure that we don't allow that tourniquet to get turned so that the parts of the body fall off. Because I'm afraid that we've kind of done that. And we need to figure out how to reattach some of these things. And I'm not sure that I know how to do that. I'm not sure that any of us know how to do that. But I know that he knows how to do that. And he doesn't call to qualify. He qualifies to call. So never feel that you can't contribute. And never feel that if that job won't get done, it might get done through us. It might get done through us without us even knowing it. It might be something we do today to encourage one of those little children like Jade or any of the little children to come to Christ. That little child. I might live my whole life to give one children's message. Have you ever thought of that? I've thought of that many times. The whole purpose for my life might be to talk to one child at one time, and I might never even remember it. Or I might not even understand that I said. I've told the story before, and I'm even a little long-winded, and I apologize. My wife's not here to collect this at me. Uh, I've told the story many before of what, the first year I helped with youth group. Um, at Christmas time, one of the little boys came in, and I'll be God honest, and I said it then, and I'll say it again. I don't know who he was. I didn't remember him from youth group. And his mom brought him in. He was real shy. He brought in. He brought me a little thing of chocolate cherries, you know. And I don't know, he must have been divine. Somebody told him that I like chocolate cherry, so I don't know how to do that even. Um, but he brought those in and gave them to me, and then he kind of scurried off, and his, his, he said, he, you know, his mom said, he just wanted to thank you for all you did for him. And I'm like, what did I do? I don't even remember you. I don't, remember, I don't know your name. I don't recognize you. So I don't know what I did. Maybe I stopped one of the other kids from picking on him or something. I, I've done that many times, you know separate kids or something. I don't know. It doesn't matter if I know. He knew. And he, maybe, maybe I lived my whole life just with that one little boy. I don't know. So you remember that. Keep working for the body. God can do all. Just keep working for the good of the body. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the message that Paul has given us in Ephesians. We need to remember that message of love. Give us patience. Give us kindness. Give us gentleness when we're dealing with those that might have 
fallen away, that have isolated themselves from the body. And there are so many of them out there, Lord. Lord, if you see fit, please give us the word carrying what we need, the guidance to do your bidding here. We pray this in your loving glory. Amen.